Well, hello there, everybody. Welcome, Larry. Standing Stones. Hello there, Trista. Mm -hmm. Lulu, welcome. Nice to see you there. Hello, Rita. How are you doing? Lovely Rita, Rita May. <laughs> Enjoy the journey. Well, I love that one. Yeah, so, Anna sure. D, welcome. Hello. So, how's everybody doing today? I'm good. How are you? Doing good. Thank you. I'm glad to be off of, you know, jury duty watch, although I didn't get chosen. Yay. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. The um the one that I got chosen, just, you know, it was like the group got chosen um, just pre, uh, you know, questions. Mm -hmm. They settled it. So before we even got through that. So, yay. I'm well, doing my civic duty. Yeah. <laughs> so anyway. Awesome. Hey, Rita, Roger. Cool. And don't forget, ladies and gentlemen, Indeed. I got a new shipment in today from Texas oh, yeah. Beer Company. I got the yeah. beer oil, the palm, and also other stuff that came in. Uh, I cannot take so many showers a day, uh, <laughs> but this month only is free shipping. And if you get on there, it also helps out the show. But if you do buy something, you also get on the waiting list for the Grizzly brand coming out probably in May or June. So just uh, remember that, ladies and gentlemen. Send me an email or message me on Facebook. Yeah. If you squared away. Thank you. Good All stuff. Right. Really so awesome. what we got going on today? Today we have John Stasco back. And um, if you remember, uh, I'm sure that some of the audience does. He was with us a month, about a month ago. And um, he's been investigating for 50 years almost. Uh, he's done 5,000 investigations about, you know, relatively here or there. Um, he's paranormal, cryptids, Bigfoot, UFOs, aliens, It, you know, you name it. So... <laughs> So, uh, yeah, we should, let's just bring him on. Hello, John. Welcome back. Hey, nice John. to have you. Welcome back. You doing? doing wonderful. Good. You. So introduce yourself to everybody all about you. Well, uh, I'm John Stasco, and I've been doing this for almost 56 years now. And, mm. um, <laughs> so it's been a while. And uh, of, of the over 5,000 cases I've been on, uh, I've debunked a lot of them. I've got about 20% of them, I think, are genuine, but... Uh, We've had uh, sightings of different things, and they came in flaps and such. So I might have, like, I know one two and a half week span, we had over over 500 reported cases of Bigfoot back in 1992, 93. Wow. Uh, but so there's been a lot of a lot of activity here in Pennsylvania, and as you know, Pennsylvania has a pretty famous uh, ridge called Chestnut Ridge, and it's a uh, it's the uh, Uniontown Mountains, uh, Summit Mountain, all the way to Mount Davis and beyond. Uh, so we have a lot of activity here and like I said, uh, so I've been doing this for like so long time because as a young boy, I got interested in astronomy and things like that. And of course, you know, the air, that was the era of all these B movies, science fiction movies and stuff. So, you know, I had a natural inclination to, to kind of go to the left here, I guess, to look into different things. But then I started seeing things. And the reason I started seeing things is I looked. Mm -hmm. You know, and I want to I want to get into it. I hope that everybody listening will kind of bear with me on this. You know, as I was saying earlier to Barb and the, to Grizzly, uh, when I first started this, there was a lot of negativity about people that did investigations or claimed they saw UFOs or Bigfoot or whatever. And we were derided in all kinds of ways, made fun of, you name it, called nuts, posters, liars, you know, the whole gamut. So I was in it before it became fashionable and th then it became fashionable and every tom dick and harry got into it you know uh but the bottom line is the infield researcher okay those are the ones that really go out there and put their lives and their health and safety on the line now i do want to say some things here before i get started um i'm i'm a admin in a, a, a number of different groups a moderator as well and a member as and they call me an expert I prefer to call myself an explorer, explorer of the unknown. And the reason I say that, and I don't like the, the designation of expert, is because there is no truly any, any experts in the field. Not everybody that's actually actively doing this are we, we're looking for answers. If we had the answers, if there were true experts, we'd already have the answers. There would be no need for all. Right. But there aren't any. And anybody that tells you that they're an expert is deluding themselves, first of all. Okay. And lying to you because there aren't it. Mm -hmm. I I know there's a number of podcasters, okay, out there, yourself uh, ex as an exception, that have never seen a Bigfoot or a UFO, but they run podcasts to make money. That's fine. 
Okay, I don't have any anything against people like that, but please don't get on there and call yourself an expert if you've never seen anything. Okay. Even if you have seen, right? <laughs> right. Even, yeah. Even if you have seen. And the thing is, is, you know, and what I try, what I try to do is I try to educate people mm -hmm. about, you know, based on my life experiences and those of others. Okay. What I see. And I try to give tips on how to do professional backgrounds as far as looking into these things, how to do plaster casts, how to take measurements, uh, what time of day or night might be best, these kinds of things. Now, these are all subjective, of course, based on my experience. Mm -hmm. But I will tell you, having seen UFOs, Bigfoot, aliens, and a black and Black Panthers, orbs, ghosts, you name it, these things are real. I mean, and anybody that takes and just arbitrarily dismisses out of hand that these things can exist or do exist are deluding themselves. You have to get out there and you have to look. And I respect all those highly qualified people to get out there every day and they do investigation. But pretty soon I, I will have to stop for a while doing any kind of investigation because I have to get some surgery on my knee. But yeah. I'll be probably laid up two or three weeks. But up until then, I'll do what I can. But so anyhow, that's all I have to say. But I want to mention some of the, the better uh, podcasts, including your own, Grizzly uh, on the Hunt. You have uh, Agents of the Unexplained with Bill Rigby, mm -hmm. BCBRO by Dan Dan Benoit, uh, you know, uh, Mike Hartman and his group in Ohio, Brian Seach in uh, West Virginia, Fred Saluga, Southwestern PA, Bigfoot Association. These are really tough, hard-nosed professional people who go out there and they put themselves out there every day for this kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, there's one man in particular, Fred Saluga, who's 75 years old. And he still gets out there and does this stuff. And he's not in the wow, best that's, of shape. I respect that's him fantastic, though. That's dedication. But, uh, yeah, it is. And he's been doing it almost as long as I've been doing it. But uh, I want to, oh, so, well, anyhow, I want to get on this. Um, about a week ago, uh, one of my friends, Dan Benoit from ECBRO, gave me a call and said that there was a uh, a man had called him. I'll just use his first name, Jimmy. He doesn't mm -hmm. want to be put out there Right. Yet. Sure. Uh, he, has a, he has a 12 acre piece of property that borders 300 other wooded acres on either side and it goes to several thousand acres around that. He claims that he saw a Bigfoot about 10 feet tall, nine to 10 feet tall, and mm -hmm. a little black creature shaking the crap out of a, a turkey that he had caught and it was really muscular. He saw it at a distance about 75 yards, I guess. So uh, I went out there by myself with this, the gentleman owned the property. And uh, as when we're going through the properties, he explained when he saw this and what where that was and what it scared him. His his mother and him had gone out there to view the property. His mother's in her 80s. And he was afraid for her sake, so he had to get her back in the car. But uh, while we were there, it's almost all uphill, by the way. <laughs> Every I I, I, I always I don't catch a break. Anyhow, so uh, as I'm going up the hill, I hit a rain. It was the ground was kind of wet. So I'm looking for tracks and stuff, and I found one track about 16 inches long and about 14 inches wide. And the reason I say that's unusual because it looked like whatever made that track slid a bit down the hill. Okay. But then when it stepped onto the more solid ground, we lost tracks. So anyhow, I gave my findings to Dan, you know, and, and, and uh, his co-investigator is also his fiance, Julie McQuaid. And we set up and went there last Friday. We were there and we scouted the property. Dan and Julie went by themselves to the other side of the property. I went to the top of the hill, the very top, for the best vantage point. And the reason I sent Dan and Julie together is because Julie's a little bit, of, I think, a little bit afraid. I don't blame her. But uh, because of this little creature that was supposedly there, too, a very violent, very muscular little creature. How did they say how tall, how big the, the I'm sorry, John, to interrupt, but did they say how tall this little black creature I, mean, I guess between four and five feet tall so uh, my, oh. uh now yeah. with the way he described it uh he said it, it was all black had big eyes and had a face of an old man so the oh. first thing i thought it could have been is an altar witch but uh you know at 75 yards we actually measured that off and, and i went down and stood at the bottom of the hill there's no way anybody can make i make out that kind of definition that yeah. 75 yards is pretty far but Mm -hmm. So it might have been a juvenile Bigfoot to have mm -hmm. to catch a turkey, a wild turkey. And right. He said it was yeah. so fast and so violently, feathers were flying everywhere. <laughs> he went down the next day, and there was feathers all over the ground. So now I have to tell you about this property. It is heavily, heavily wooded. And, I mean, there's berries up there, wild apples, uh, mushrooms. Uh, there's plenty of deer tracks. I found plenty of deer tracks. 
So there's ample food there and there's ample range there. Now, just so you know, this is about a mile and a half away for where last summer where my wife and I had taken our great grandkids and we went up to uh, Mingo Park. And uh, there was another man and his wife and their children up there playing at the top of the park. And the man himself looked at him and said, look at that. Because I was talking with him. About 300 feet or so away, we saw something about eight feet tall standing in the woods. Too big for a bear. Uh, black bears don't get eight feet tall. Mm -hmm. Okay, not around here. And so, but it disappeared before I could do anything, get my binoculars and check mm -hmm. it out. Yeah. That bad. Anyhow, so this is pretty close to that area. Now, this is also close to an area where back in 1993, I did, an, or I'm sorry, 1991, <laughs> I did an investigation of a, a landed, right, a landed <laughs> UFO, supposedly. I actually have a pair that big, by the way, just so you know. You got to take the lens covers or whatever it's called. Too. Yeah, you got to take those lens covers off. <laughs> I, I use see. that on many investigations on the police department. Right, so yeah. I'm just saying. There you go. Well, hey, I actually um, have a... John, let right. me, I'm, I'm so sorry to interrupt, but I don't want, I want to, don't want to get too far because there was, we already, had, we, we had a question. Um, does John, oops, I just, does John remember, oh my gosh, I'm sorry. Does John remember the huge UFO flat back in 1971? Uh, standing yeah, stones. Yeah, he was in Boston and saw one at close range. Yeah, I actually have. I do remember that. Uh, you also had, a, you had a, during that period of time, they call them flaps, where you have a lot of UFO activity and uh, showing up and everything else. Mm -hmm. Like I said, I, I'll get into that in a minute, but there's okay, a, yeah. I mean, I've been on a lot of flaps, trust me. And I'll okay. get into really get into Okay, that, sure, sure. Okay. So anyhow, so we're, we go up there and they were getting cold. So I told them to come up to where I was. So they trudged up to the top of the hill with me and I had everything set up up there. And I carried a big, powerful handheld spotlight. And I you let want me grab and some. Walk. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> anyway, it's actually, like Vanna. It's actually a, Grizzly's going to be like Vanna. Like, here you go. Yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah. It's it's actually a forty channel CB. I had two of them, so oh. I let them use one. I use the other one. It's real well, powerful. Yeah. So and you know, so they got out there and stuff, and we were talking for a while, and we were trying to, we were going to set up a bionic big ear, but there was so much wind and, and leaves that we we couldn't use it. There's just no way we could pick anything up. But we did go up there. We had binoculars and such. Anyhow, so we get to, they get to the top of the hill. And we're talking for a while. And at the distance, Dan spy, uh, had spied two lights in the distance about uh, between an eighth oh. and a half a mile away. Now, what was unusual about these lights, they were pure white. They were hovering just over the treetop. Now, the gentleman that owned the property told us that he'd had a lot of lights low flying, okay, shining beams of light down onto his property. So you had the Bigfoot, the little creature, and... Now, beams of light coming down from unidentified craft in the air. So now, just so you know, the nearest air, uh, airport to that would probably be uh, Ross Draver Township, which is on Route 51, which is pretty far away. And then you have the one in Connellsville and, and elsewhere. But so there's no near airports there. Mm -hmm. Now, it wasn't a helicopter uh, because of, it, of its movements. There was no other running lights, just these two white lights. And they were slowly circling each other. So after a few minutes, we're trying to get pictures of this. And every time, so when Dan reached up his phone to take a picture, the lights went out. Wow. Then he put the phone, then he put it down, the lights came back on again. So, but here's the thing. And I mentioned this to Dan. I always carry a compass with me, okay? And I wanted to get a reading on the direction they were at, you know, in. When I picked my compass up and looked at it, it was spinning like crazy. Now, my compass is fine. There's nothing wrong with my compass. It's a really good one. And it's just started spinning as this thing approached. Now, what I did is I shine my spotlight on it. And it's like I said, it's a very powerful spotlight. And Julie says, my gosh, you're going to attract them to us. I says, well, that's the point. <laughs> so the one stayed at the distance and the other one started coming to our right. Now, I watched it. It was moving very slowly, erratically, but very slowly. It went to our right and about, I'd say, about an eighth of a mile away. And it came down. As it came down, it turned red. And it went down below the tree line. A minute later, came back up, turned white, went back to where the other one was, and they were like in a formation, one here and one down below it a little bit, but just above the tree line. And this went on for about, I'd say, 10 to 15 minutes. And we tried our best to try to get pictures of it. We couldn't get it because it was dark, and they just kept shutting their lights off. So we don't know what that is. Now, the only thing up in that direction where that was is the Pittsburgh uh, – Amateur astronomers, uh, one of their observatories, of which I'm a member, by the way, 
And we have two, one in Pittsburgh and one in Mingo Park. But there's no other houses or anything up there, okay? And at the uh -huh. time of night, it is, the park is closed. So there's nobody up there whatsoever. And there's no reason for anybody to be up there doing this stuff. So anyhow, after that, we decided we we're going to leave. And we're going to try to, to go back. And we're going to ask the property owner if we can actually camp out overnight up there. Now, I want to say something. I had mentioned to you in the previous show that I had done an investigation for about a year on a Bigfoot before we got any kind of result. Generally, when you do these type of investigations, you don't get immediate result. You don't mm -hmm. get, I mean, you may never get any result. You may mm -hmm. never see any. You know, you can only go by whatever the person that said they saw these things said they saw. And that's it. If you're lucky enough, you might see something. Okay. And I've been fortunate in that regard most, well, not most of the time, but a lot of the time. Uh, but we're going we're gonna to try to go back there and we're going to try to set up a, a long term investigation on it. Dan, come, Dan and Julie live up in Somerset, PA. I'm here in Washington, PA. So we have to work it out the details and all the logistics, but we're going to do it. We're going to go back. Mm -hmm. We do believe, and just so you know, on this property is a collapsed mine shaft, oh. and there's tunnels supposedly all over this property. But mm. some are so thick, I have to use a machete to cut my way through. That's that thick. Wow. Well, like I said, there's, there's ample food and shelter there for any large creature, you know, no matter what it is. Mm -hmm. anyway, so that's just one. Now, I want to talk about something else. Uh, you know, people are, there's, there's some people that don't believe there's a connection between UFOs and Bigfoot. Okay, that's fine. Uh, they can believe it or not believe it. But I've been on a number of cases, at least five, where people have seen UFO in close proximity to a Bigfoot or a Bigfoot going into or coming out of a, uh, a UFO, hovering or landing. One case in particular I remember back in Westmoreland County back here in about 92, I believe it was where a man was walking with his son. They lived on a farm and along the tree line, they saw a Bigfoot about eight feet tall or so. And immediately thereafter, they saw a UFO lift up off the ground behind these trees and the Bigfoot stand there looking at it. Okay, now, is that happenstance? Is that coincidence? I don't think so. I think there's something going on there. I just don't, I can't put my finger on it. Okay, but there's some type of connection. Okay, just don't know what it is yet. Uh, having seen Bigfoot three times and getting within 15 feet of a big one, I can tell you something, in my opinion, categorically, these are not animals. These are not animals. The, you know, what I mean by animals like deers or bear or mm -hmm. you know, anything like that. Mm -hmm. These are some type of intelligent, sentient creatures. What are exactly they pets, are John? They? What's that? Are they pets? <laughs> you know, what's funny you should mention that. Uh, you know, I think it could be a possibility. You know, uh, I talked to a, a lady a while back. I'm not going to mention her name. And she had actually saw Mothman and, uh, back in 67. And she said that she saw an orb and this thing come down and get out of this orb and stuff. And what's there? What, let's take hypothesize. Maybe it, maybe they, maybe the aliens do bring a pet. Maybe they bring something it can take and do the work, the hard work they themselves can't do because of their smallness and they're not built for this atmosphere. Mm -hmm. My own theory is this, and I mentioned this in my in my first interview. Uh, during the Paleolithic era, they had large megaflora and megafauna. Okay, you had the giant cave bear, 15 feet tall or so. You had the, the giant ground ground slot. Ground sloth. You had dire wolves. You had the Androsarchus, which was the biggest land predator at the time. You know, uh, uh, Smilodon, saber-toothed tiger, lions, etc., etc., etc. So, if I were an alien race, race coming back to do exploration, exploration of this planet, you know, that that many years ago, I wouldn't want to put myself at risk. But I would bring something that could do the work for me. Maybe, just maybe, they brought something that was more akin to this these big creatures environment to do their work for them mm. and maybe again i'm all hypothesizing yeah. maybe maybe these creatures some decided to stay because they like it because it's close to whatever their home world is mm -hmm. okay mm. I had interesting i had mentioned this before that you know there's only a few reasons why something has long arms and climbs a tree here's what here's the reason food sources up in the top of the tree to escape predators or shelter Okay. Mm -hmm. 
Well, something like a Bigfoot that has to climb a tree to get away from a predator it must mean there's a pretty big predator down on the ground, right? Okay. So let's just, and we know that Bigfoot has been spotted in trees. Okay. So mm -hmm. I, I really, like I said, I don't know what, what these things are, but I can tell you what they're not. Like it says, people say that uh, they're an animal and there's some people want to go out and shoot it and, and capture mm -hmm. it or whatever. I, I, unfortunately, I believe the only way it's going to happen, we know it really get to the truth of this matter, is if one is caught or killed, okay, where his actual body. But, and I hope that doesn't happen. I hope mm -hmm. that doesn't happen. I, I mean, capturing one, like I said, we can capture orcas, we can capture a whale, we can capture sharks, you know, all kinds of other big creatures and stuff. There's no reason in the world we shouldn't be able to capture something like that, okay? But then again, I don't know. Mm -hmm. uh, but there, uh, the, to, like I said, when I saw that 10 foot tall one, I got within 15 feet, probably closer mm -hmm. to 12 or 13 feet. And people ask me, well, what did you uh, notice about it? Well, I noticed the smell. It smelled like death. It smelled like dead animals. It smelled like leaves and moss and dirt. And it was filthy. It had long brownish red hair, you know, and eye shine, which primates don't have eye shine, by the way. And I mentioned that before. Uh, but this thing had eye shine. And this thing was looking at me. And uh, I felt it was studying me the way it was standing and looking at me. And I got about 15, 20 seconds or so, I guess, of it looking at it before it strode 30 feet and, and about, 10, about three strides, I mean, big strides into the woods and crashing through the woods. I found hair samples, which I turned into the university, as I said before, and they came back unknown hominid. And uh, that was one of two sets, by the way, that I turned in. Same thing, same reaction. So as far as Bigfoot, like I said, uh, what I would suggest to anybody going out there, uh, take your proper gear with you. Don't go alone, okay? Let people know when you're gonna be out of the woods. You know, there's a set of time. Take extra battery, battery packs for your phone. Take extra batteries for your uh, your lights, that kind of thing. Some kind of gear that you, if you break your ankle or whatever, make sure you take these things. But do a proper investigation. Write everything down while it's still fresh in your memory. Or better yet, take a tape recorder as it's happening and talk about it. So you don't, you know, miss out on anything. Because every detail helps, okay? The problem, as I see with most investigators that go out and feel that are, I call them rookies, is they don't do that. They go out for the, uh, the entertainment and the excitement. And they, like I said to you earlier, Barb, uh, when they do see something, they run like little rabbits, okay? But here's the thing. You're there to find something, right? Whether it be Bigfoot, aliens, ghosts, orbs, whatever. That's what you're there for. If you don't want to, if you're that scared, don't do it. Stay home, crochet, <laughs> watch somebody else do it, you know, whatever. Then you have a number of shows on TV that really upset me because everything they hear in the woods is a Bigfoot. <laughs> I can tell you that night, that we, every, not everything in the woods is a Bigfoot, okay? Yeah, uh, for sure. Yeah, uh, you got to be careful, too. When you're out there, there, there are black bear, okay? And you better take some bear spray with it, okay, <laughs> just in case. Now, uh, Dan and uh, the owner of the property, we were down there, they're both armed, okay? And that was a precaution just in case because they had talked about this little black creature and stuff, which mm -hmm. in my mind might have been a juvenile. OK, mm -hmm. I don't think it was a, a demon or anything like that. I don't think it was anything supernatural. And uh, I want to mm -hmm. clarify something about that. A lot of people get confused when they say paranormal and supernatural. Two different things. Paranormal actually encompasses everything that's not normal. That's true. Mm -hmm. Supernatural kind of borders on things like vampires and uh, ghosts and demons and those kinds of things. Okay? Mm -hmm. and, my mind okay uh, but the, the more physical type things like bigfoot and aliens and stuff like that they are they're paranormal mind that's just my mind okay mm -hmm. uh, i wanted to talk about something here too um uh, we talk about ghosts <laughs> i'm going to switch gears here a little bit okay uh, uh i actually went on old route 40 up here years ago the college owns the, owned the property and it was a, a bell tower and it was about 60 feet tall and it was a big house and such. And people were saying it was completely abandoned, by the way. And it was across the road, believe it or not, from a big cemetery. So just envision this. It was like a dip 
And this house sat off on the right, and the cemetery was off the cro uh, on the side of the road. And when I first went up, there was fog drifting across the road like this. So people had told me that there were blue lights in this bell tower. So I went down, of course, and uh, I went into the house. The ceilings were like 12 feet tall. It was that big of a house. I did some background on the house. Come to find out the dorm prohibition, they had a sub-basement where they were making and storing hooch. Mm. Okay. So, and supposedly some people were killed on the property. And there's old, there's an old oil well there, too, of all things. And can you define yeah. hooch for the audience, please? <laughs> um, alcoholic beverages. There you go. Alcoholic <laughs> beverages. <laughs> Not the ones you get from jail, ladies and gentlemen. No. <laughs> there you go. There you go. Uh, you know, that's another thing I wanted, I wanted to talk about for that just for a, spe a second. You know, I watch a show called Moonshiners on TV, and it's, yeah. it's, it's pretty good. It's very interesting. I like it. <laughs> not, that not that I'm making any, but, yeah, I uh, love but one, one of the guys actually came up here to Washington PHR Winery to get some tips. But anyhow, mm -hmm. uh, you know, all these moonshiners go out. They're in the woods all the time. Mm -hmm. I would love to talk to a moonshiner that's seen something in the woods if they were come forward. Yeah. I would love that because they're always in the woods. Okay, West Virginia, Kentucky, mm -hmm. Tennessee, those places, they're always out in the woods making their hooch. Okay. Mm -hmm. But yeah, so that's something for, for maybe you two to Yeah, or if the, the um if the Bigfoot or you know Sasquatch, if they ever have messed with their, you know, their stills and things like right. that. I wonder. Right, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Because I'm I I'm I mean, there's rival uh uh moon mm -hmm. that destroy each other's right. stills and things like that. Bears do it too, they'll tear it up too. But mm -hmm. you know, I'm just curious about the old timers if you know, maybe seen something or and mm -hmm. people that work power lines and things of this nature too. Mm -hmm. You know, uh it's hard to say. Uh park rangers as well. Okay, I like to get you know, talk to some of them as well. Mm -hmm. But um that be being said, getting back to this ghost thing. So I go up in this house and I go through all the house and stuff and I started feeling kind of weird you know, have my equipment with me, my EMF detector and everything else. And it was fluctuating pretty good the further I went upstairs. So I got to the top floor, which is three stories up. In the bell tower, you have to go through another door and climb some steps, or I should say a ladder, like up into the bell tower. I saw the light. I go up in the bell tower, there's nobody there. Nobody there. The light's gone now. So yeah, that's, that's just one type of little wow. ghost thing. Mm -hmm. Now, when I was a kid, I lived in this house. It was about 200 years old. It was a brick house, and it was next to a mortuary that was abandoned. And the guy that owned the mortuary used to store bodies in the back room of the house we lived in before we moved there, of course. And so I was sitting there one night, and my parents had gone and take my younger brothers and sisters to Kennywood Park, and I really didn't want to go, believe it or not. I wanted to stay home and watch TV and Magilla Gorilla and the Avengers and all these kind of things I used to watch. But... uh. So I heard a noise in the back room, and I had to go back there, I think, for a book or something. When I went back there, there was several orbs in the back room just hovering like this, maybe about, about that big, about the size of uh, a softball. So I've seen orbs, too. Okay, I've been on a number of cases. Uh, another time, I went, uh, there was a, a woman named Susan, and she lived in, in Crescent Heights, and she claimed that there was an entity in her house on the second floor, and it was an old coal mining house. You know what I'm saying? They used to have these row houses. And such. Mm -hmm. So I know how to clear a house. Okay. But so I go up there and stuff. And she did, I said, don't tell me where you saw anything or felt anything. Let me do it for myself. Mm -hmm. So I'm walking from room to room. Everything seemed fine. I walked up the steps. I made a left into this one little tiny room. And right there, I found a, I felt oh, no. like a big cold presence right there. So I took and I blessed the house. I used sage as well. And everything stopped. Conversely, her and her mother started talking to me, and they said they saw a bigfoot down the road. From that's all. This is all within. I mean, this is all within this ridge area I, I go to. I mean, there's all kinds of stuff going on up there. Mm -hmm. So, but she says she saw about an eight or nine foot one down there, and that's close to that Crescent Heights a case I told you about uh, a while back, mm -hmm. where uh, Mary Rob Jackson from Channel Two News, Katie K here in Pittsburgh, and I went down with her news crew, and we found mm -hmm. two sets of tracks, but. Uh, that's another story, that's but, amazing. uh, but so then Susan's telling me that she has a friend named Phil, who's a police chief down there and they have an old school that they use a municipal, as a municipal building, but there was something in the school and it was spooking the police chief. Now this mm. is a little rural community. Okay. So I said, well, okay, I'll go down, we'll go down meeting. So I go down to this old school building, this old wooden school building and in the mm. back of it was a big garage 
built right into the school where they had buses. They kept their buses. So I said, don't tell me anything. I talked to the chief, and his name was Bill. I said, don't tell me anything. Let's let me find for myself. So I took my hands, and I put them out like this, and I started walking through the place. And I got to the – now, he didn't tell me anything. I got to that bus uh, garage and put my hands there, and again, I felt something. I don't know how to explain it, but mm -hmm. I felt a presence there. Come to find out, it was the mechanic who he actually lived in that bus garage with a coal stove, and he used to work, and he died back there. Oh, wow. so we didn't we didn't clear that because Bill says, "Look, we he, he's fine." He, I just wanted to know what it was. Mm -hmm. But uh, the thing is, is that I mean, just these are just some of the cases I've been on as mm -hmm. far as this. I think I we had a question. Um, we had a question from Val. Uh, John, okay. have you investigated? Uh, I don't. I'm not sure what this is. P A C I S, or the castle in, in Brownsville. Oh yeah, that's Nimicolin Castle. Yeah, I've been there. Oh, that's okay. Nimicolin Castle. Yeah, that's uh, that was during the uh, the Civil War. That was one of the underground railroad stops oh. for the uh, the slaves that escaped from the South up, and it's mm -hmm. called Bowman's Castle. Okay. Uh, but it's the, it's on top of the hill across from the new Brownsville Bridge on the right-hand side. Yeah, I've been in there. Uh, I actually, my wife and I went there a couple years ago. We didn't go inside. We were outside because it was closed that day. But uh, I had been there myself. And that's it's supposedly haunted. And I believe it is. But like I said, spirits don't just show themselves anywhere, okay? They just, mm -hmm. whenever they want. And as far as that goes, uh, got a little theory about that, too. Uh, it seems to me that spirits can take and they suck energy out of uh, electrical appliances. It could be a battery. It could be mm -hmm. just about anything. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think the reason is because they need energy to do a manifestation. Okay. Mm -hmm. Makes so sense. that's why sometimes when the investigators go down to these places, their, their cameras may stop working or, you know, go dead or their lights might go dead because it's sucking energy. So, uh, I, that's why I always say take extra batteries and sing. <laughs> yeah. But uh, I want to say you've got to differentiate between uh, a ghost of a human being mm -hmm. and, a evil, and an evil entity. There's two separate things there. Now, I want to talk about the shadow people. Okay. Uh, shadow people aren't ghosts. Okay. In my opinion, again, this is all my opinion. Mm -hmm. I think shadow people are. Um, somehow manifesting through a another dimension. They, may, they mm -hmm. somehow can manifest that way. Mm -hmm. But you do have demons. And I, in my life, I've seen one one demon. Mm -hmm. And it scared the living crap out of me. And I'm not easily scared, I'm telling you. you know, uh, anybody knows me, I'll tell you that. Mm -hmm. It was uh, out, out of a fluke in my house. Can you, can you describe it? Do you feel comfortable describing it? Yeah, I do. Uh, and well, now it's been... My uh, yeah. first wife and I, we weren't married at the time, but she was staying with me in my mom's house. And uh, let me digress a bit. When I was a kid, I bought a Ouija board. That was a big fashionable thing back then. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Big mistake. Okay. So I asked the Ouija board one day, how many people, uh, how many ghosts were in the house? And it said seven, mm -hmm. which is exactly the number of people lived in the house. Anyhow. So. <laughs> I went, I lived in Pittsburgh for a time and I came back one night and my wife and I were sitting downstairs in the living room with my mother. My dad had passed away, by the way. He was a chief of police where I lived. And um, mm. anyhow, so we're sitting here and my brothers are telling me about this, all, all kind of stuff going on in the upstairs room. So I'm like, yeah, okay, sure, right. Just about then the ceiling started bouncing like Ugh. this. And then I had a glass of water on my left. It lifted up in front of me like this and levitated over to my right and sat down right to the side without spilling a drop. Oh, wow. Um, right, exactly. Now, there was about maybe six, seven people in the room with me at the time. Then the ceiling bounced really heavy. So I went running up the steps and I challenged whatever it was. Big mistake. Mm. You don't challenge these things. They feed on negative energy. Okay, first of all. That's what makes them strong. They like to feed on your fear, which is also negative. So moving along, things kind of calmed down for a bit. But like I said, I lived in Pittsburgh. So my wife, who was pregnant with our child, went out when I were married. And we have the house. My mom had passed away because mm -hmm. she was in bad shape. But anyhow, uh, mm -hmm. so we had the, the small bedroom upstairs. And there was three bedrooms upstairs, a big one. So we had a middle bedroom upstairs and we just had this new baby. Heather was four pound, nine ounces of birth. She was a preemie. Wow. So she was tiny. I couldn't bring her home for nine days. 
So she couldn't walk, she couldn't roll, nothing. So when I came home, I heard my, my baby crying. So I went running up the steps and my ex-wife who was passed away also, by the way, she had, she had made like a baby uh, sleeping bag for the okay. baby she keep in bed with her. Now mm -hmm. the bed was maybe two feet off the ground. So it was pretty high on the side. No baby. I saw my wife wakes up and I said, where's, where's Heather at? And she goes, I don't know. She was just here. I had oh. her in my arms. So we're looking, looking, we hear she's under the bed. So I was really upset. I was ready to kick my wife's butt, oh. you know, but what we, anyhow, we took her to the hospital, no broken bones or nothing. She was like, she was placed up under the bed. Whoa. But that, after that, things started happening in the house again. Lights started flickering on and off, that kind of thing. So I got really concerned about that. So uh, we decided we're going to move downstairs. So we stayed downstairs because I didn't trust what was going on upstairs. Mm -hmm. So sure. I'm laying there. I'm laying there. And we had a pull out bed, like a sofa bed. And we were laying on there sleeping. And I felt a weight on my chest. So I think it's my wife's arm, mm -hmm. right? So I went to turn. I couldn't move. Now, it wasn't sleep paralysis, like people might say. But I felt this tremendous weight on my chest. Now, I'm awake. I'm wide awake now, but I can't open my eyes for some reason. And I'm trying to fight to open my eyes and I'm like, and I'm making noises and which is really kind of weird because my wife was laying right next to me. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I finally managed to open my eyes and I looked up with this tremendous weight on my chest and I looked up and there was this huge head. Oh. I'm telling you, it was like this and it was that eyes and they're red. And in the center, it was like slit. Like oh. this. And had, I had like two large canines to the side. The head I would imagine was like, Oh, I'd say uh, 14 inches wide. Wow. And but there was no form to it. It was just like a black mass around it like this. Mm -hmm. So now I'm trying to scream because I can't move. I'm making noise when it finally I managed to scream and it laughed. When it mm. when it laughed, it disappeared. Mm. Well, I'm by I woke, I mean, I was awake, wide awake, and I just I broke out into a sweat because what like I'd that. seen, you know, and I had never seen anything like that. So mm -hmm. That Ouija board was still in the house, by the way, from years when I was a teenager. So I next day I got that Ouija board out. I put holy water on it. I burned it out in the backyard. Mm -hmm. But I called, uh, first person I called was a priest. And I called this priest to come down and I explained the situation and stuff. And I said, look, I said, there's something going on in the house. And he believed me because I went right to his, his parish and stuff. I said, look, I'm Catholic, by the way. Uh, not really good practicing at it, but I'm, I'm Catholic. <laughs> so... Uh, Anyhow, so he came to the house and he went from room to room. I didn't tell him where the where it was. It was an, it, the entity itself had moved to that middle room upstairs. I told you about mm -hmm. where we had slept. Mm -hmm. So he blessed the house and he was scared. I mean, this priest was scared. We heard noises and everything else. And then he, you know, then he left. He said, "Hopefully things calm down." Well, they did. About a week later, it started back up. So I called mm -hmm. this woman I know is a psychic. I didn't tell her anything other than we had some things going on in the house. I didn't tell her what room or nothing. That's another thing as an investigator. I don't want you to tell me specifics when it comes to ghosts or things of this nature. Let me see them for myself. Okay? Mm -hmm. You can fill in the blanks for me. So this, this lady comes down. Her, her nickname was Chicky. Her name, real name's Glenda. But anyhow, she's a really good psychic. And I don't know if people believe in that or not, but uh, uh, there are some real ones out there, okay? Mm -hmm. Like Long Island one, the ones that lives in Long Island. There was a, another guy too, by the way, that does this. But anyhow, so I didn't tell her anything about the rooms. Now there were seven rooms in this house. Every room she went to was she goes clear. It's clear. She got to that middle room upstairs, and she says it's here. Oh. Now in the summertime, that room was ice cold in the cool. Mm. It could be 85, 90 degrees outside, but it was cool in that room. We didn't have air conditioning then. Okay. So mm -hmm. she said it's here. She said it doesn't like children. Oh. It doesn't like children. It wants to. It it wants to take children. Oh gosh. So and that's what these negative energies do. Like a, a, a for instance. Uh, well, I'm really getting off tangent here a little bit, but okay. When people do this so-called astral projection, okay, mm -hmm. that's let's say it's genuine. Okay, I don't know if it is or isn't. Or remote viewing, for instance. Okay. They open themselves up. Now there are negative energies out there like to occupy that space that you're in. Okay. They can possess a person. I've been on, I've been on possession cases too. 
Okay, one up in Wilkes-Barre years ago with the Warrens. Uh, so yeah, that I believe in as well. You, I mean, if you believe in God or angels, you have to believe in the devil. Mm -hmm. All the de devils are fallen angels. Okay, so and they possess immense power, but they get their power from negative energy. Okay, mm -hmm. anyhow, so after that, and before I I don't want to get too far. Um, Brian Barber had asked. Uh, John, does John think spirits and Bigfoot drain energy in the same way? Uh, I, Draw I energy. Know, well, well, I don't know if, uh, if so-called, if I don't know if Bigfoot actually draws energy. I know it uses infrasound to kind of mm -hmm. scare you, make you feel like uh, kind of insecure, just like a tiger might do or something like that. Mm -hmm. uh, now, we're going to get way out there with this, but people are claimed that Bigfoot could be a, a descendant of Gigantopithecus or the Denisovan, the uh, ancient hominid, okay? Mm -hmm. Some people say it could be interdimensional. Some people say it could be an alien creature, okay? I'm of the opinion that it's it's a physical creature, okay? I think it does have some attributes which are unknown to us that because I haven't yet, I have yet to see a really clear picture of a Bigfoot, mm -hmm. okay? Now this might be several reasons for that. One of which would, you know, you yourself saw one, okay? Mm -hmm. But it was, you weren't expecting that. You didn't have mm -hmm. a camera handy. <laughs> a lot of people. I did, people, but I, I was so shocked. I just dropped, I just dropped, I just, yeah, I just dropped it. I just was so scared. But shocked. see, a lot of, some people are just walking out in the woods, taking a hike and they see one. Some yeah. people are driving down the road and they see one. Mm -hmm. They're not, and by the time they react, it's gone. Mm -hmm. Those things are going to sit around and pose for you, okay? Right, right. <laughs> same thing with same thing with aliens. It's not going to sit around and pose for you, okay? Mm -hmm. But now, as far as the negative energies, the negative uh, entities, yeah, they draw energy. But they they draw energy. I believe, like again, this is all subjective in my opinion, based on my life experiences. Mm -hmm. They draw from if they can get you to be afraid. They know what your fears are. They can prey mm -hmm. on your fear, okay? Mm -hmm. They so they take that energy from you. Now, you know what a psychic vampire is? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, well, but go ahead and explain for the yeah for the viewers. Okay. Well, a psychic vampire is a, a, could be a person that, like, if you feel uncomfortable in this person's presence, you've never known this person, but you feel very uncomfortable in this person's presence, okay? They're actually drawing energy from you, a type of negative, uh, they're, you're in their energy. So you feel drained after being with them. I'm sure mm -hmm. everyone, you too, I'm sure you met people that, that you've been around, they just seem to drain the energy right out of you. Okay. Mm -hmm. So they're, they don't, they don't even know they're psychic vampires. Then you have emotional vampires as well. They play on a person's emotion. Okay. So, um, but insofar as comparing a negative ener entity with Bigfoot, as far as drawing energy now, I, again, I don't think so. I don't know for sure. As I said earlier in the show, when we first started, there are no experts in this field. Mm -hmm. Okay, they're okay. only they're only experiencers, explorers. Like I, I call myself an explorer of the unknown. Okay, and an experiencer, and there's researchers who do the paperwork and they check on other people's cases and they put it out there for the general public. You know, we need to get answers. Okay, mm -hmm. and I've always I've always tried to get all these groups I belong to to kind of work together. And to a point, we do. Here in Pennsylvania, we have some groups that do work together. We have I met a lot of good people. Uh, you know, in this, that's really serious. They don't have a lot of funds and things like that. Mm -hmm. And by the way, I've never charged a penny for anything I've ever done, not for any speaking engagements, not for any investigation, not a penny for gas, nothing. I do this for the passion of it. I do this for knowledge yes. because there's, th there's things in this world that's going on that, that people are so wound up in their daily lives that, you know, with all the strife and chaos in the world today, you know, the wars that's going on, the economy, the politics, all that. Then people are like with their phone. A big put, I mean, you know, I, I go up, my wife works part-time at Walmart, okay? Mm -hmm. I've seen people come walking out of that store with their phones, right into traffic, expecting <laughs> people that are driving through a yeah. for them. <laughs> okay? So they could, a Bigfoot could be walking right by some of these people <laughs> and they would never see it, okay? They would right. never see it. Right. That's just the way it is. But... <laughs> uh, yeah, no, I don't. I, to answer your question, I don't think that uh, Bigfoot draws energy like that. I think it can make you feel like it does when you mm -hmm. see something that scares the crap out of you because it's something so unusual. 
you've been to if you've been to a zoo, okay, and you've seen a gorilla, okay. Now imagine that gorilla not behind a cage. And you run <laughs> yeah. into a gorilla in the woods. You know, uh, I, I give Jane Goodall all the credit in the world for coming up right next to a, a mountain gorilla. For sure. Oh my gosh! Yes. Uh, but can you imagine if you're uh, if you go out to your backyard and you see a a big mountain gorilla like they're looking at you? What are you going to do? Well. <laughs> You're going to do one of two things. You're going to either run or poop your pants. I hate to say it like that. That's just the way it is, okay? It's just the way it is. Um, so you, you I have, did have uh, a question, John. Um, and um, I was asking you this a little bit before the show. A friend of mine was asking um, if, there, if you had heard about um, any sort of Bigfoot activity in Center Hall, Pennsylvania, going on. Um, and that's in, in Center County. Yeah, center count. No, I not yet. But like I said, I mean, okay. I haven't got to everything. I get okay. so busy with all these groups I, that I, I'm an administrator. Mm -hmm. I, mean, I want. Uh, I'll tell you what. I was for about a week. I didn't look at any of my uh, my Gmails or anything like that. I got back. I had ten thousand Gmails Ugh. to get rid of. Mm -hmm. I try I to stay up with all. Right. I mean, I I uh, I'm in uh, Bob Lazar and Beyond. Uh, mm -hmm. That's a UFO group that. John Lanigan up in St. So Marie, Canada runs and uh, I'm his chief uh, admin and uh, he's, he's the one that this group is centered on uh, Bob, Bob Lazar guy that's mm -hmm. going to be in the 51. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but then I have agents of the unexplained ECBRO paranormal productions with Brian King sharp, uh, all these things. Okay. So yeah. I, I get kind of busy, you know, plus I have things going on in my family, you know, uh, sure. my health. You know, uh, I, uh, but the thing is, is no, uh, I haven't got to that yet, but I will look into it. Yeah. And, being that's, yeah. and but being that's not too far from where uh, uh, Dan and Julie live, they live in Somerset County, which is south of there. Maybe mm -hmm. we'll take a ride up there and take a look. But I'll, I need to get some information from you maybe after the show. But uh, uh, we have one. We have a question from Standing Stones. Um, what do you know, if anything, about the 1971 UFO? Is it Florida? He's FL. Is that what you mean? Are you talking okay. about Point Breeze? Is that what you're talking about, Stan? Oh, he's saying, oh, Boston. oh in Boston? FL. I don't know what that is. Uh, not too much. I really don't know too much about that because at that point, like I said, I was pretty much centered on stuff around here. But in Boston, mm -hmm. you know, we're uh, the group I belonged to at the time run by Stan Gordon was uh, we did statewide stuff uh, and uh, things of that nature. But we pretty much confined ourselves to Pennsylvania. Oh, he's but, saying uh, flat. Flap, boss. Right. Okay. Yeah, there's yeah. well, there's flaps. There was a flap up in New York too, along mm -hmm. the highway up there. Was a uh, where the giant uh, triangular shaped objects were as well. But you know they come and seem to come in droves, and we've been having a lot of UFO activity lately. Yes. So um, mm -hmm. I I don't know whether it's because of the wars in the world right now. Uh, mm -hmm. I mean, there's been sightings over Ukraine. There's mm -hmm. been sightings over China and Russia, South America, uh, Australia. You know, I have uh, other admins that I keep in touch with. I have one in uh, Israel, uh, Polly Rotterman. She's a really good admin. I made her an admin in the group, and uh, she sent me some bona fide pictures of UFOs oh. over Israel. So, uh, you know, and I, I trust her, and she's a journalist too. So I know, mm -hmm. I mean, she's not going to put nothing out there, you know, nonsense. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. I do want to say something about that. You know, I've seen some of these groups where they take a picture you know, Paradoy is, and they'll circle, they'll put a red circle around thing and say, that's Bigfoot. Come on, seriously, you know, uh, or they'll use AI generated uh, pictures. Well, yeah, it's, yeah. It's Bigfoot. Mm -hmm. And that's what's hurting this field. You know, it's bad, en it's bad enough that uh, the, the, the mainstream scientific community doesn't take us seriously, okay? Mm -hmm. I, I mean, other than other than a few people like Dr. Jeff Meldrum, I, who I admire immensely, you know, Ken Gerhard's a friend of mine as well. Mm -hmm. These people are, you know, are, I believe, you know, in these, these people and stuff, but mm -hmm. by and large, I, I don't, I don't dislike the red circle. And I'm just going to say why, because like, I'm relatively new. I, you know, to, to, um, seeing them, you know, in coming up in my photographs and in videos. And so, um, a lot of people will send me, uh, a photo and say, what do you think? I think I see a Bigfoot. And like you said, many times they're not at all um, clear. 
in the photo. So I just kind of like, if you can tell me the general area, you know, um, that I'm looking because with pareidolia, you, there's a lot of things that you can see, you know, that you can kind of, right. uh, think that you see. So that's the, that's my, my, um, you know, take on them. But, um, anyway, so. <laughs> 98 point cent, uh, 98 percent of the red circles are, are not even Bigfoot pictures. I'm sorry. Right. Yeah. But, right. I mean, do we know that for sure? Like, is yeah. that what, I mean, I don't, I mean, that's, yes, you know, again, yeah. it's just like, you know, um, because people, recall? people want to believe that they're seeing something, but mm -hmm. they're not, mm -hmm. you know, well, because I, I go out and take thousands of pictures. When I go, I went out today, didn't tell nobody. Yeah. I don't tell anybody, right. but I can bring up photographs and be like, good God, look at this. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and I'm like, that's not a Bigfoot, ladies and gentlemen. Well, yeah, yeah, because there's definitely things that can that can so, appear that way. You know, it's really John. You know what I mean, though. I mean, you oh, look yeah, at the yeah. photographs. You're like, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I go, yeah, I mean, yeah. I try to be nice on these sites and stuff, but uh, I get to a point sometimes. I'm like, come on, seriously. But you know, uh, like Paradoy, as far as like you know, when I was a kid, I used to like to look at the sky a lot, and I see clouds, mm -hmm. and you can see anything in the clouds, right? I yeah. can see birds or ships or whatever. Because <laughs> yeah. 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 the human mind, the human mind is geared mm -hmm. to see it's you it's you it's geared to see things. It's geared mm -hmm. to see figures and things of this nature. So, and he's right, Grizzly's right. Like I said, you go, I mean, there was one I just saw. Somebody made an AI uh, picture of a Bigfoot with two feet, and they showed the bottom of the feet. And even though the person mm -hmm. who put that up said that it's it's AI generated, but you had still had some people believing it might be. And it, we, it was obviously the guy said, look, I made this. Okay. Yeah. Same thing with, same thing when you have footprints. I saw a picture somebody put on their Facebook the other day of a, a footprint. Supposedly it was Bigfoot. It wasn't Bigfoot. It was a guy's foot. You could see the, the, the marks from the bottom of the shoe. <laughs> yeah. You know, uh, and, and like I said, you know, uh, and I got to say this too about Bigfoot. Uh, what by whatever name you call them, anywhere in the world, you have Bigfoot like creatures. Okay, you have Yowie, you have the uh, in Australia, you have the Yeti, you have the Yaren, you have Sasquatch, you have Bigfoot, you have you name it all over the world. Is creatures that are similar like that. Now, one of my friends asked me about the three toed type mm. Bigfoot, mm -hmm. what I thought. Well, look, the Bigfoot that I saw had five toes, five big ones, 22 inches long. Okay, that's a big Bigfoot. That's a, mm -hmm. that's that, that indicates it's a, that indicates about a ten foot tall. Anyhow, based on an anatomy. But anyhow, when it comes to three toes, we have human beings are genetically uh, altered through bad DNA or whatever. Okay, you know that, right? So it's possible that maybe a Bigfoot had some mu mutation. Okay, because of all the toxic stuff in the environment that people put out. Okay, so mm -hmm. that's a possibility. Then again. Then again, maybe it's a whole new type of creature. I don't know. Mm -hmm. But I I mean, but the ones I'm, I'm familiar the most with have five toes, five fingers, that kind of thing. Now, I also saw something somebody called, uh, what was it called? A Tantos creature, 12 to 25 feet tall. Oh. There's no King Kong running through the woods out there. <laughs> seriously. Ser seriously. If there were, if there was a 25 foot tall Bigfoot running around out there, I think we'd have known about it by now. For real. The army would have been out there trying to hunt it down and put it in a cage somewhere. But anyhow, it's been my experience, 10, 11 foot, maybe maybe 12 at the most on the outside for a fully mature Bigfoot. But the average, what you're talking about, between six and seven and a half foot, six to eight foot, that kind of thing. That's about the, the norm. Uh, like I said, I don't know what these creatures are. I know what they're not. They're not, I can't say scientifically categorically because I don't have their actual DNA. But I can tell you they're not a descendant of Gigantopithecus. Now, I want to say this, too. Somebody had put on Facebook also, do they eat bugs? Yeah, they're omnivores. They're going to eat whatever they need to eat. They eat deer. They eat plants. Okay? Berries, such. They pretty much eat the same thing the bears eat. Okay? Mm -hmm. I mean, they'll kill it. They'll hunt down a deer and run down a deer and kill a deer. They'll eat small game. But the differences I've noticed, between, there's a difference between the west, northwest coast, the south, and the northeast coast Bigfoot, Sasquatch. I'm from now on, I'm just going to say Bigfoot. But anyhow, mm -hmm. uh, the northeast ones, I have, I have, my personally, I've never heard of a case in northeastern part of this country where a Bigfoot has attacked somebody. They're, they're not attacking anybody. Okay. 
They're not till killing sheep or cows up here. And I'll tell you why I think that is. They know what man can do. And they know man has dogs that can track them down. If somebody starts killing my, my cattle, I'm going to find out what's going on. I'm going to put out search parties and everything else until I get whatever's killing them, right? Mm -hmm. But they're not doing that here. Now, in the Northwest, there have been accounts of people being attacked, supposedly mutilated, torn to pieces, okay, abducted. Down south, the skunk ape, okay, the bogey creek monster, that kind of thing, the folk monster, okay. There seem to be more, the, the further they are away from more urban areas, the more feral they seem to be and more territorial. Mm -hmm. The ones I believe around here, and Mary Robb asked me this years ago, she said, what do you think about where they go? I said, well, I think they, they're nomadic around here. They travel maybe 60, 70 miles, wherever the food goes. Mm -hmm. And the reason, because there's so many people now, so many things springing up around here, around the city. So they're trying to stay away from people as much as they can. And, you know, yeah. the land is, the, develop, the land's getting more and more developed because there's more and more people. So, I mean, the one down in McMurray that I was on for a year, that's 12 miles from Pittsburgh. I mean, when I tell people, if they go, are you kidding me? I said, no. Yeah. So it was on McMurray Road for crying out loud. Now that big field back there where we thought it was in the woods, it's all condos. So wow. Not there anymore. Right. But, but uh, then I want to talk about this. Black Panthers. Okay. <laughs> Twice in my life I've seen back Black Panthers. Once when I was 12, year old, 12 years old delivering newspapers, I thought it was just a big cat. About a 75-pound cat. And I was with two other paper boys that were with me. We used to stop at this stop at this gas station and get some Yoo-Hoo pop to drink. Remember the Yoo-Hoo, the chocolate pop? <laughs> oh, yeah. We did, we'd stop there in the summertime, get something cold to drink, and so we're looking up the hill and we see that it looked like a big black cat, but it was a, a panther. So that was supposed to be extinct, but they are. They're around. I mean, I, we're losing probably 30%, 20 to 30% of species nowadays, okay, they're becoming extinct because mm -hmm. of man's encroachment, because of uh, disturbing their cli the climate and their environment. They're destroying. I mean, eventually, I think what's going to end up happening is we're going to, we're going to see more and more Bigfoot sightings mm -hmm. or they're going to be moving further away to the north where there's more forested land, things of this right. nature. Mm -hmm. But uh, right now, I can tell you that uh, in this area, uh, we do have Bigfoot. Mm -hmm. You know, I believe the tracks that I saw were real. I mean, the two, the one the first day, then one the second. Mm -hmm. uh, we really couldn't get a plaster cast of it because what had happened is it had rained and it washed it out. Yeah. And the second one, the same thing when it, so it stepped onto solid ground. So, but yeah. uh, I want I want to tell you this too. Uh, have you ever heard of a deer backtracking? I, I've heard of, I don't mean, is it, I believe that that's what, that that's what Bigfoot does. Is that it what did. the it, deer it did? Okay. Uh, and bears don't backtrack either. Mm -hmm. When we went up to the one on Crescent Heights years ago, the two Bigfoot, we, we followed their tracks because it was snow and dirt. We followed the tracks to the edge of the hill, which overlooked this small town. And the tracks ended right there. And I'm looking for tracks over the hill, so I don't see anything. I'm like, what the heck? I it didn't grow wings and fly. Mm -hmm. And I, 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 so I looked again at the tracks really close, and you can see where they stepped backwards into the tracks. Well, they in straight line because they're straight line. Yeah. Back into the yeah. woods where there's a lot of brush. Wow. You lose their track that way. So that it's makes, not an Yeah, that makes so much sense that they would. Um, we have a question from Val. Curious, John, have you heard of the ghost bard supposedly seen at the at times at Maxwell Locks? Uh, years ago, we had something like that. I know where the Maxwell Locks are at. That's uh, uh, on Brownsville side. It's in Fayette County. In fact, I used to date a girl down that way. But uh, yeah, I, I've, I've heard of things like that and on the river, things like that. And we've had some curious occurrences on that river. Anyhow, the Mon River, uh, years ago, don't laugh when I tell you this. This is kind of weird. Uh, we had a ferry boat, okay? And the ferry boat used to go from Pole Center to Newell, PA, to Allied Chemical. And when I was a little boy, uh, supposedly, listen to this, a, they found an octopus of all things that crawled oh. up on the end of the ferry boat. An octopus. <laughs> Now, I don't, to my knowledge, no octopus is in fresh water. Yeah. Wow. I don't know. Wow. Also, in, 
1947, in 1947 in California, outside of California, PA, a book for Bigfoot like creature, they called it a hairy man, was seen coming out of the river. Okay. Now there's large embankments all up and down that river. They're, they're, mm -hmm. they're like clay. So that kind of led me to believe that maybe they can live up underneath the embankments as well. I don't think that they, I can't rule out anything of where they may stay. You know, mm -hmm. they could be in old, we have a lot of mines around here too that are abandoned. Yes. They go down pretty sure. far. Uh, mm -hmm. Caves, we have a lot of caves, shell caves as well. And like I said, so I can't rule out any of that. I will tell you that when I have followed tracks. Uh, I, I used to walk the creeks and I'd walk with rubber boots on, you know, knee high rubber boots. And I walked through these shallow creeks and I'd look off the embankments on either side to see if I saw any tracks. And this is all around that area where Bigfoot were. But here's the thing. I found tracks that were like five feet up over the embankment. So it was in the water. So the tracks wouldn't be showing on land. But when it stepped out, it stepped at least five feet up over the embankment and then disappeared into the woods. So these are smart creatures. Mm -hmm. They're highly intelligent. Like I said, they know what man can, is capable of. I mean, to an extent, they know about our weapon. They know where they can be shot. Mm -hmm. you have, we have cases where people have tried to shoot at them and stuff. Some people actually pulled a gun on them and, and didn't shoot them for some reason. So, uh, like I said, these are intelligent creatures. And stuff. Mm -hmm. um, I just want to say to our viewers, we're going to, um, we'll wrap up soon. So if you have any questions for John, let, yeah, get them in. Um, but what this has been good, fantastic. Yeah. Um, I wanted to ask you with Chestnut Ridge that you're, you're talking about the Ridge and you're referring to Chestnut Ridge. Right. Is that correct. What do you think is the deal with that area? What's going on at that, that, that there's all sort of occurrences. Well, of here's the thing. You, you, you have Laurel Caverns up there. I, uh, mm -hmm. and you have a lot of caves up that way and stuff. And it's a pretty isolated area, except for that church camp that's up there. And there's some isolated houses up that way. It's pretty, you know, it's the second tallest mountain in Pennsylvania, mm -hmm. but so I'm not sure what to make of it, but I can tell you that when Devin and I went up there to do that investigation and for a, a, a UFO, that we saw military vehicles with their lights off and a helicopter, black helicopter with its lights off coming down that ridge and stuff. We were followed by a military type vehicle, which is a truck. Uh, I don't know what to make of it, but we did go down to it. There's a military base not far from there. And we went down, we had a chance, to talk. we got an uh, audience with a lieutenant colonel down there. And we, I wanted to ask him about UFOs. So everything was hunky-dory while we were talking. He was laughing, joking with us. He had a, uh, an Air Force, uh, I guess it was a sergeant in the room with him, standing in attention by the door. So we're in there talking. Everything, like I said, was nice. So I said to him, I said, so, Colonel, I says, where do you keep your black helicopters? All of a sudden, his face dropped. He said, we don't have black helicopters. You know who the Night Stalkers are? Have you ever heard that term? The Night Stalkers is supposedly a clandestine military unit that down, uh, follows and retrieves down UFOs. Oh. Okay? I personally have seen two black helicopters in my life. One over my house in broad daylight and once on that ridge with Devin. Mm -hmm. Okay? So I know they exist. Mm -hmm. now, John, do you think we have a question? Um, does John think that Bigfoot and UFO are intertwined or just coincidence with both being in the same area? No, I don't think it's coincidence. Okay. I think that, and I know there's going to be some people agree with me and uh, disagree with me in this field, but there's been too much, uh, I can't say evidence. There's been too many reports uh, mm -hmm. of them being seen together or in close proximity with one another. The chances of them being coincident is astronomical. Okay. Right. I, I think there's a connection. I do want to say something. We didn't really touch on the uh, the UFOs as far as the aliens themselves. Yeah, John, we have to wrap it up because we're oh, broadcasting oh, yeah. on other yeah. channels. How do yeah. people find you and get a hold of you? Yeah. Uh, yeah, you can you can actually get a hold of me through any of the groups I mentioned: ECBRO, uh, Agents of the Unexplained, uh, Paranormal World Productions. Uh, oh, let's see what else: Bob Lazar and Beyond. Or you can get a hold of me through Messenger. Or on Facebook Sasquatch itself. Odyssey, is that right? Paranormal Odyssey, is that yeah. right? Still, yeah. yeah okay, yeah. great. Yeah, yeah and uh, um, yeah, you. and after you have your surgery, and and you know, and we're gonna we're uh, all praying for you and thinking about you and send you good um, you know, vibes and everything for your surgery. Good luck with that. And after you recover, you know, and you feel up to it, then I can get you back here for um for part three on aliens. We'll just focus on aliens, and you know, yeah, I would like to do that because yeah. what I want to do in the meantime is I want to send you some pictures because I have. Sure. 
I'm doing that. I'm doing that speaking engagement May 25th up in Somerset for okay. Miss uh, Miss and Monsters. Uh, so I'm taking. I have seven photos of a close-up UFO. They hover okay, over. Okay, great, talking. fantastic. That'd be so great. I'm gonna send you that and some, some other stuff. And then, talk about uh, yeah, I would love to do another one and stuff. But yeah. uh, I just want to say something. I really enjoy your site. I think you you're on track as far as being doing things professionally. And I'm not just saying it because if anybody will tell you that knows me, I don't kiss butt. <laughs> yeah. Well, thank okay. you. We appreciate if it. Don't be grateful. Yeah. You know, I, when you're for real, I'll be on it. I mean, I have another one to do here soon for a guy named Bob Solomon, but I haven't scheduled that yet. But I'm trying to get everything as much as I can done before I go into the surgery and stuff. And right. hopefully I'll survive this time. Aww. But uh, <laughs> I almost died last time. Uh, oh, gosh. But, yeah. Blood clot. Thank but you. Anyhow. Oh, my goodness. Well, listen, you, you guys have a good evening and, and I'll talk to you later. All right. Thank well, you. thank you. And don't yeah. forget, this is brought to you by Honey Shuck with a beard and stash wash. We got dark ice, tobacco, bait leaf, rugged leather, and a perfect gentleman in stock. Don't forget to message or send an email and we'll get you hooked up. And once again, thank you, John, so much. Thank you. Thanks, thank you everybody. Thanks so much, John. Thanks, everybody. Have a great night. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. All right. Bye-bye, everybody.